Hello and welcome everyone to the Heal Yourself, Heal the Earth Global Online Conference, where you will receive inspiration and empowering tools to deepen into your path of personal and planetary healing. I am your host for the event, Monique Chalice, and today I'm really thrilled to be speaking with Cater Brown. Now, Cater is an internationally known ceremonialist and cowrie shell diviner. He's also a healer, intuitive, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 35 years of professional experience. Welcome, Cater. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, good morning, Monique. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. It's great to have you as part of the conference. And the title of Cater's talk today is Looking for Home spirals of memory and belonging. So let's start with that really evocative <laughs> title. Can you tell us more what you mean by looking for home, spirals of memory and belonging, and how this relates to the overall theme of the conference of healing ourselves and healing the earth? Yes, the, um, it's a name that, or a, a title um, that came to me, um, actually wrote a, a poem about that with that title. But when I think about um, the earth and healing ourselves and healing, our, healing the earth, um, I'm aware that the elementally, as far as earth as an elemental medicine um, and what's needed on the planet is, is really about home and belonging and place and connection, connection to our ourselves uh, in our, our medicine that we carry connection to our families our communities our loved ones and so this idea of belonging and connection um, is is the uh, prescriptive response when, when doing earth rituals um, part of my uh, background and in, in experiences of uh, working with melodoma some and 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 indigenous rituals is that um, this idea of diagnosing a situation through divination and then offering a ritual prescription in response. And so when I looked at the title of, of this conference and I thought about earth and healing ourselves and, and healing the earth, I realized that the, the turmoil uh, that I believe is happening internally and externally is this one of belonging and one of connection. And so, as a result of our own uh, woundedness and homelessness, uh, we don't have connection uh, outwardly to, to the earth, to all the other creatures and species on the planet in a way that is uh, more harmonious, more connecting. Um, so I loved your title. I also have a, uh, a background clinically as a psychotherapist for many years. So this idea, of how I've witnessed as people heal themselves, their compassion just normally extends out. Once they learn how to feel compassion for themselves, extends out beyond themselves uh, to their surroundings, to, to uh, their environment. Um, it's something I've experienced in my own healing journey. Um, so this idea of uh, looking for home and finding home and, uh, in the, in the circling or spiraling of memory and belonging, the way that we um, often dive into these areas of memory, some unresolved, some sometimes tumultuous. Um, on the, uh, when I talk about initiatory journeys, I always say that, you know, like there's two trajectories of initiatory journey. And one we'd say is a, uh, journey of ascent or that of fire and and that's like being possessed by a passion uh, uh, something that we can't stop we just have to roll with it and and some and in indigenous culture they might say you're possessed by a genie and if you hang on you might survive it <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other trajectory is is a downward uh, into the earth into the water into the lower world and this is an initiatory journey in mythology of kind of going to the underworld. And it's one of memory and belonging and healing and reconciliation and ancestry. It's a place we do our, our shadow work, our healing work. 
and without doing that, um, we tend to disown our own shadow qualities, wow. disown our own turmoil, and then create turmoil, you know, on the planet with each other, with with the rest of the the, the planet, and um, and so this idea of the initiatory descent into the underworld, into the earth, is a, a necessary journey that often gets overlooked um, in a culture where everybody wants to be spiritual, you know. <laughs> and this yeah. idea of spirituality uh, is something of uh, that that lacks a ground of being of you know what's what's your personal story? What are the what are the ancestral uh, threads? Uh, that need healing. Mm. And so this idea of belonging, not just with ourselves and with the planet, uh, but also how do we belong ancestrally? And where have, where is there brokenness and, and disruption in those ancestral lineages uh, that create turmoil? <clears throat> so there's an old, uh, an old Irish proverb that says that the troubles in this world can only be healed from the other world. And the troubles in the other world can only be healed from this world. <clears throat> so there's this reciprocity of, of healing and tending um, that in, in modern culture we've cut ourselves off from. Mm. Um, and so it's not only how do we heal ourselves, heal the earth, but, but our, our ancestry is so much a part of that. Our ancestors uh, are part of that healing. Um, mm. So those are things that just come to mind that, that uh, stimulated that particular title. That was beautiful. And I so agree <laughs> with you. There was a lot in there. <laughs> I so agree with you about the disconnection and, and how we have to look at our own shadow. So, and everything else you said. Um, so in your work as a healer and ceremonialist, I mean, you did say we, we need to go within and look at the shadow. What are the, what are the main areas of healing that you see are needing attention? Kind of what's your perspective on healing? Um, my perspective, similar to the, the information I was just talking about, this idea that healing has to be in, more inclusive. <clears throat> okay. Coming from a, a background of, of psychology over the past 30 years <clears throat> or 30 plus years, this idea that healing was only related to myself and how I felt about my surroundings uh, or pe people and how people thought about me. And if I was good with that, then we'd call that psychological wellness. <clears throat> and so this, this old paradigm of uh, psychological wellness was very limiting in that it didn't include much else other than the humans. <clears throat> that one could have a, an okay human relationship and function in a, uh, a very dysfunctional, disconnected world. And by definition, it looked good and was treated as you're, you're doing well. Mm. <clears throat> and so to extend this uh, paradigm of healing uh, beyond the human realm um, to the non-human realm and, to <clears throat> and beyond the... <clears throat> the living to the non-living. Um, so this idea of uh, healing is something that includes uh, well relationships with our ancestral helping spirits and also acknowledging that there are a lot of unwell uh, spirits in our lineages that would say that their turmoil then becomes our turmoil. And so patterns in our lives where um, where we simply just can't change something, uh, it seems to be more deeply ingrained. And as we as we look into, it, we find that oh, these are these are more ancestral patterns or unresolved grief that have happened in our lineage. Um, and so there's numerous stories I can think of of, of where that's the case and. Um, so this idea of healing is a much bigger context of what's meant by community. Mm. And that the word community, um, we can think of as much more inclusive uh, than the human realm. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if you could share one of your stories 
um, <clears throat> must have many over your many years. Yeah, I've, uh, well, I can share one from my life. So um, when, uh, before I was born, um, my mother uh, was told by the doctor she couldn't conceive children. I don't know. They didn't really say why. That was often something they just told women when they couldn't figure out what was going on. And, uh, and my mother ended up adopting uh, a, a child before me. And, um, and then all of a sudden she got pregnant. And um, they decided to name me the name Cater and middle name Stevenson after two of my dad's brothers that both had died early and both had died in the, in the 30s and 40s. Um, I was born in 60, so it's many years before. And uh, so Cater died at 30, about 35 in a house fire. And Steve, my uh, middle name, died at uh, 19 in a car accident um, from a head injury. So when I'm born, I'm carrying these, these unhealed ancestral links, turmoils, challenges. So um, going into the delivery room, my, my mother's told by the physician, well, the cord's wrapped around his neck and he's a placenta previa and we don't know 50-50 chance he'll live or die. Of course, so I didn't and I was born. And then at two and a half years old, I am in a car accident and thrown out of the window and skid across the pavement and hit the curb and I'm in a coma for three weeks with a head injury. Now this is what my, and they decided to call me Steve when I was younger. So this is uh, what happened to Steve at 19. So you can almost say I'm, I'm following this particular passage. Um, when I got to be around a little older than 19, I just intuitively decided I was gonna switch my name and go by Cater. Um, and then when I got to the age Cater was in, when he died, I was doing my first, a little before then, a few years before then, I was doing my first vision quest, which is about receiving a new name. And, um, and then the vision quest ceremony became a, a ceremony that I was passionately drawn to. And so it's a death and rebirth passage. Um, so in some ways I can say that that, that ancestral uh, grief and turmoil was a, a prerequisite uh, to the life I'm living now. In another way, I can almost say that that ancestral loss and grief and turmoil was uh, had to be recognized and turned into something else. Otherwise, I would have gone down that same path wow. um, and died early. And so these, uh, which was thought of me at different times in my life. You know, what, you know, don't know if Cater is going to live. Um, so it's because I had other near death, ex I've had three near death experiences. Um, so it's just an interesting, I began to look at this link between ancestral lines and the unwell dead um, and how to heal those ancestral lines. And that's part of our healing. So we're not, uh, healing is not an individual. Um, dilemma. <laughs> it's a, a collective responsibility. Um, I love so that. It's a, say it's a much bigger picture. Uh, and today we have things like epigenetics and systems of psychotherapy like uh, constellation work and these things that start to bring in the ancestral realm in terms of our own healing process. Um, and then that, of course, extends out to the, to the earth. Mm. Uh, so this idea, this woundedness of belonging and place and connection is uh, magnified by the, uh, the turmoil we perpetuate on the planet with, you know, with the state of things, as it were. Absolutely. That's what the whole conference is talking <laughs> about. <laughs> so do you think that everybody on the planet today has ancestral healing work to do? Um, I do. And what, uh, unless they've been doing that work consciously and intentionally to heal their ancestral lines, um, because the 
or unless they live in an unbroken indigenous mm. community in which the rituals, the grief rituals, and the ancestralization rituals of how to tend the dead and ensure clear passage and, and clean passage for, for, the, for the dead as they transition. Because those rituals and ceremonies aren't done, you know, exactly. uh, on, on a large scale anymore. Um, another quick story is uh, I was working in a, a recovery uh, rehab wilderness center. <clears throat> and I was talking with these two parents and they brought in their 17 year old <clears throat> and they said, we don't know what's going on with our son. He was doing great in school, great grades, athletics, you know, had great, good social relationships. And then his birthday came, he turned 17 and he got terribly depressed. <clears throat> and so I thought, hmm, this sounds like an ancestral connection here. And so I decided to just shift my perspective and looking at the two adults in the room with me. And beside the mom on one side, I saw the image of an old man standing beside her. And I saw the same standing beside dad and the chair he was sitting in. So I got curious, who are these, who are these, these people, these old people, these dead people. <laughs> and so I asked mom, I said, tell me about your family. You know, what was it like growing up? And, and, and she said, well, um, my, my dad killed himself when I was around 18 and she kind of dropped her head and was very stoic about it. And so we talked about that. And then I talked with the, the father and he's, and he's telling me his story. And he said, well, my, my grandfather um, kid, committed suicide when my dad was around 19. And I, oh, so now I know who these other two uh, spirits in the room are. And now I know what's going on with this 17 year old. So as he enters this age range, all of this unresolved grief, the Buddhists might call it a hungry ghost, kind of lands on this young man and because it's looking for an outlet. Right. And, um, and he's the most vulnerable host because the parents have become shut down. And this, this uh, disconnecting we start to do to manage our own pain and traumas or ancestral pain and traumas, this way of disconnecting and disassociating from it only results in our disconnecting and disassociating from being able to notice the hummingbird on our back porch or the hawk that's circling in the air um, or, or the fox that's kind of walked out of the woods and looked in our eyes. We, we lose connection to these other things because we've disconnected from our own uh, turmoil or our ancestral turmoil. Um, and so healing ourselves uh, is an essential uh, to be able to, to connect deeply in relationship with the uh, uh, other than human realm. Mm, absolutely. So would you say beginning with looking towards the ancestors is the place to start? Would you mm. use past life re regression? How could somebody identify these um, ancestral patterns or these unresolved ancestral um, traumas that they need to well, one is, is uh, simply just looking at our lives mm -hmm. and is it, is it functioning well or do, are we encountering a, the same kind of dilemmas over and over um, and don't seem to be able to shift them. And maybe we've even gone and see a therapist or a healer from another uh, discipline and, and we may get a sense of it, but it doesn't quite shift. It seems to be something deeper. Um, then it would be important to look deeper. Um, there's an indigenous uh, healing practices. There's, a, there's an understanding that I carry. And one is that if there's trouble here in this realm, it means there's already been trouble in that realm. And so we look there to see where the trouble's been and respond ritually to that trouble so that we can then respond clearly to this trouble um, with the help of uh, what we might say the bright and shiny ones, not the unwell dead, but the bright and shiny realm. Um, and so it becomes, again, this, this sense of connection um, with, the, with the, uh, those uh, well ancestors, we could say. Um, 
And so patterns, ingrained patterns and inability to shift something um, could be an indication, but um, I always think start in the present moment. What's happening? You know, what's the, what's going on right here? And is, is there a thread that connects? Oh yeah, my mom did that or my dad struggled with that or his dad struggled with that. Or, um, you know, when my great granddad left Ireland with his two brothers and came to this country, um, one of the brothers died. And then several genera a couple generations later, my dad is born. These are important links. Um, that which is a true that's part of the my my genealogy story it's like these important pieces um, that we're not separate uh, from these these threads of connection right um, it's in our bones it's what we call our our bone memory mm. or epigenetics if we want to use a a, a modern term <laughs> right and there's now even behavioral epigenetics emotional epigenetics. Mm -hmm. Because when I studied um, nutritional therapy, we were told it's not just what our mother ate when we were in the in the mm -hmm. womb; it's what our grandmother ate. Right. And we have no control <clears throat> over that, but that's still mm -hmm. affecting us now. Right. Yeah, I, I did some was doing divination with a, a lady that lives in the UK, but her ancestry is from Ireland, and we ended up tracing this uh, this pattern of inability to uh, give birth there was like numerous miscarriages to the potato famine okay. and what was left in the lineage at that time because of the nutritional impact. Mm. Um, so it's, it's fascinating these links, but they're, uh, yeah, we could say behavioral, but there, there's also a field of energy or a field of uh, what in psychology they call the field now mm. um, where these things are connected. And so healing any healing work that we do kind of ripples in both directions, both toward our great grandchildren and toward our great grandparents. Absolutely. Yeah. Because there is no time. It's just a right. construct. All time is right. now. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what would you say if someone didn't know their ancestry, didn't know that their grandparents mm -hmm. came from Ireland, with the divination, can you talk a little bit about your divination technique with the cowrie shells and how that, um, would you be able to trace um, what the issues are if you didn't know that much about your own ancestry? Right, it's, it's uh, so you're accessing different type of information than going on ancestry.com <laughs> and, and tracking the, <laughs> getting the map of where your, where your genetics are from. Um, although that's very useful. Um, and <clears throat> so in a divination, uh, cowrie shell divination, a process I learned from Maldoma Sobe and started practicing back in 2003, um, there are divination items that one, uh, that I would read their placement on, um, what they would, what people call a medicine wheel, but in, in his tribal tradition, it would be their cosmological wheel. It's so an element, five element wheel, so that fire and, and water and earth and mineral and nature are the five elements that one is born into or born with. And um, so in the divination, um, a person would simply bring questions. That would be how we start. And they would say, you know, here's my questions. Why, why do I keep struggling with this? Um, I, had, I was doing a divination with a lady that, had had a breakup a couple of years earlier and came to me because she said this grief doesn't seem to be uh, subsiding and it doesn't feel like it's about um, the relationship. It feels got complete and but the grief like I can't get out of it. And so through the divination, um, I would ask, I ask certain questions based on what I was seeing in the reading, <clears throat> and it turns out um, that her mother's line um, was from uh, Glencoe Valley of Scotland, which the McDonald clan and the McDonald massacre happened. And so she was a direct descendant of that line. And so what I realized is that this, this grief had tapped into something uh, much bigger for her. Um, and so the ritual response and the ritual prescription actually involved 
um, going there and doing some ritual uh, with with those ancestral lands. Um, I was going to ask, could you give us an example of a type of a ritual you would employ in these mm -hmm. cases? Um, depending on, <clears throat> so ritual prescriptions can be elemental in nature. Mm -hmm. So if you think about, um, well, think about modern psychiatry. And we have a, a book probably this thick now of diagnoses <laughs> and, and a whole list of medications. <clears throat> and that's where we go to to figure out what's going on with somebody psychically and emotionally. <clears throat> In indigenous culture, um, there, uh, we would look the, like in medications, we, if you look at a medication bottle, it says active ingredient somewhere on there. And it's usually a big word nobody can say. And, <laughs> and <clears throat> in, in ritual, the active ingredients are the elements. Mm -hmm. And so is this, dilemma, is this a dilemma of earth? Meaning uh, an issue of belonging and place and connection. Do they feel homeless? Are they sense of disassociated, disconnected from their body? And then when I hear things like that, even this conference, excuse me, it's like, oh, this is a, a ritual that would involve earth. And not, there, there's different faces of earth. We think of earth as uh, spirit, um, which is a bigger, bigger conversation. And we think of earth as elemental medicine that is offered in response to a sense of disconnection and homelessness and dissociation. Um, so an earth ritual prescription would address those kind of uh, states of turmoil or disruption, um, connecting with the land of one's ancestors would be a way of reestablishing connection because there was a time if we follow our lineages far enough back where identification with bloodline and identification with land intertwine, they're the same and there's no separateness. And so um, places where people have been forced off their land, like in this country, the Native Americans, or you know, every, everybody's been at some time persecuted and, and displaced. Um, and so I found that these broken places not only have to do with our lineage, blood lineage, but also with connecting with you know, the spirits of the land and place and a sense of, of home and belonging. Mm. Um, so how would you reconnect? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. No, that's, um, I love going down these rabbit holes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so one, uh, a ritual of, um, an earth ritual. And there are thousands of ways to do an earth ritual. Um, is that, uh, I mean, a simple one could simply be creating an earth mound, a mound of earth at the base of a tree, say. Maybe, maybe a two trunk tree, we might say, um, as a connection with the ancestral realm, a two trunk tree would signify that. And so this mound of earth, um, and maybe we brought some, uh, maybe we had somebody send us some, some earth or some mineral from the, from the lands of our ancestors, and now I have it in my backyard and I mix it in this earth that I have. Um, and then, um, Maybe I've found, uh, I found this ring that I want to represent my connection with my ancestors and connection with my ancestral lands. And so I bury it in this earth mound and I call in uh, my ancestral helping spirits um, to help me have connection and, and heal this brokenness um, of this connection that I feel in my body. Um, and so beginning there, um, can also activate, uh, it may activate grief. It's, it's not like these ritual prescriptions take us out of the picture of having to move emotional energy. Because if there's unresolved grief that I have identified, then I become the hollow bone to heal that unresolved grief by surrounding myself with support and just letting it be there. Um, so connecting with earth, as a uh, a ritual uh, medicine um, that's about connection, belonging, grounding. Um, a lot of these rituals can be they're very spontaneous and or come out or, organically in a in a divination. 
um, a more radical earth ritual might literally be being buried up to your chin in earth with some other uh, ritual container around it um, and being held by earth. That'd be what we call a radical earth ritual. Wow. Um, but a simple one could literally be gardening. Yeah. I had a, um, a lady in Canada I was working with and, um, and what came up in the divination was something she had to do with her mom. I said, does your mom uh, need to connect with earth? It's like, there's something showing up here. And she said, yes, she loves to garden. She doesn't garden. I don't know. I would never get her to do a rich earth ritual. I said, don't worry about that. Just, you know, send her some wildflowers and uh, help her plant a, a, you know, a flower box outside of her kitchen window or, or get her hands in the soil. And she said, yeah, when she does that, she really feels good. I said, well, that, that's an earth ritual. Get your hands in the soil. I feel that connection. Yeah. Um, so earth being a, uh, a res earth medicine or earth as an elemental medicine as a response to, again, disconnection, uh, a response to belonging, um, you know, in our own skin, belonging within community, um, a sense of lack, which we are really big for scarcity and lack on this planet, that, that uh, particular paradigm. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. And that, that, comes, that comes from disconnection. So that scarcity, uh, the illusion of scarcity comes from living out of balance with our environment. So when we live out, live out of balance, scarcity is the paradigm we're operating in. Right. And, and so again, connecting in with, with the realm of nature and earth and learning to live more in balance uh, takes care of this, this uh, kind of dilemma of scarcity right. uh, and fear and, and uh, circling the wagons to protect the last resources. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh my goodness. So much of what you said is just, it could go so many different ways, but um, I did want to ask if, if you know you're disconnected from your ancestral lands, but you, you kind of brought that in with that earth ritual. If you can, if you can obtain some earth from where you are. So say you're displaced. Mm -hmm. um, does that matter if, if you can't get soil from, from your ancestral lands? Can you just um, do a ritual that that includes that place, you know, if you're, yes. you know, like I'm in a city right now, most of us <laughs> here didn't come from here. Mm -hmm. So we're physically disconnected as well as emotionally probably and, you know, spiritually disconnected from our place. And what if you don't know what your place is? Mm -hmm. How do you find that? <clears throat> and not knowing one's place is certainly an indication of, of disconnection. Um, it's uh, the, 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 the response of the heart is the most clearest communication with the non-physical realm. <clears throat> so when one's heart and one's intention is, is of, of clear uh, intent, no, you don't necessarily need to be able to get somebody to send you some earth uh, from Winston-Salem over there. Um, but you might create an ancestor shrine. Um, and you might have... Um, a way of uh, uh, mineral is a, in, when we talk about earth is assisting people with belonging. Mineral is about information, communication, stones and bones. And, and so I might, on my ancestral shrine, I might have a, a couple of stones that I just tap together when I, when I communicate um, to the ancestrals that were connected to the land that my people are from. And so I'll talk with them and and create that connection. Or I said that the it's like uh, yeah, <clears throat> like the way sweet grass is braided together for ceremony. Our, our bloodline ancestry and and the the land that they're from at some point when you go far back is braided together. It's in them, and so it's the same. You connect in that line, and they have the connection. They will they will source and and connect you to that in your imagery in your in your heart in your uh, creative expressions it'll just start to flow through um, so beautiful so we're not bound in this time space uh, 
reality where everything has to be physical before we call it real. Mm. Um, that we can, you know, we can make those connections even if we're, you know, in a city and, you know, don't have any trees around us or earth anywhere. <laughs> right. Right. But we can all plant a seed and <clears throat> take a pot on a windowsill. Right. And right. that that does connect you to the cycles, mm -hmm. you know, nurturing the seedling and then mm -hmm. waiting for it to fruit and then maybe mm -hmm. the the vegetation dies back and and I find that really, really healing for me in right. anyway, and kind of rewilding because mm -hmm. that's how nature is. It's cyclical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you bring up this this term rewilding. Um, it's it's a, another one of those rabbit holes I love. I talk about the rewilding of human nature mm. um, <clears throat> in this way that, um, you know, in our country, they studied the, the, the red wolves uh, interaction in Yellowstone National Park. And they say 25, 30 years ago, they reintroduced them into the park. And then after all this time, you know, they showed how this, these wolves restabilized the entire ecosystem, animals, everything, even the course of a river shifted because these wolves were put back in. Um, and they said, you know, whenever you take the top predator out of its ecosystem, everything is disrupted. Yes. And so that got me to think, and I thought, well, you know, so if humans are the top predatory animal on the planet, which we are, and we've taken ourselves out of connection and balance with the ecosystem that everything is disturbed. And so this is about the rewilding of human nature. Um, yeah. and putting ourselves back in. Um, that's part of the healing of self and the healing of earth is really the rewilding of human nature. Wow. And so got, it's, yeah. Yeah, I got chills when you were talking about that. Yeah, that's amazing how wolves changed rivers. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And they found this, they studied other creatures where any time that the top predator was removed from its ecosystem, that everything shifted and changed and got out of balance. And um, so, yeah, the answer is the rewilding of, of us, the, of human nature. Yes, because humans have removed most of the apex predators out of most ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And then, and so most ecosystems are disrupted. So we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. And well, we removed ourselves first and then began to systematically re remove the next one in line. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so <laughs> what are some more ways that we can address all these imbalances and, and continue to heal ourselves and the earth and the ecosystem? Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> to uh, look at it wholeheartedly, to not not shy away from the uh, from the pain of it. it it's um, that is so important. <laughs> I started. Um, most people have heard of of um, Joanna Macy, um, and in in some of her conversations, she would say, you know, I used to think that. Um, that it was greed and ignorance that got us in this position. She said, I don't think that anymore. I think it's the unwillingness to feel grief uh, and to feel deeply. And so what I found, um, even through doing uh, community grief rituals, that it is the, the unacknowledged grief that begins to open the doorway and um, to compassion, to, to awareness, to consciousness. Um, otherwise, we can see, you know, something show up on the news in our living room about this species or, or um, you know, the, was it the Shark Cathedral caught fire in, in Paris and everybody reacted, um, but the Amazon being blaze and nobody doesn't even kind of register for a lot of people. Mm. Um, and so this idea that we've, we've disconnected from our, our, our own natural wildness, our own connection to the natural world. Um, and so this, this important piece about, um, 
looking inward and, and feeling, beginning to open our hearts again. And sometimes we need help. Sometimes we've shut down uh, for fear of further pain. Mm. Uh, or our ancestors shut down and we just grew up with that because great grandmother and great grandfather decided not to feel the, the turmoil and the loss of what was going on. And so the, the lineage became uh, disconnected, we could say. So this um, connecting to our bodies, in our the wisdom will begin to connect us to our heart um, to allow ourselves to slow down <clears throat> um, and uh, we're, we're in a we live in a culture where it's all about stimulating more activity and more noise so that we can feel alive and eventually we don't feel alive so we have to up the the intensity to feel alive and but if you take those same people and put them in, in a uh, low intense environment, say in nature, or somewhere quiet, what starts to happen is all the unresolved, untended uh, wounds and scars start to rise to the surface in the quiet. And if there's enough support around them, they can, they can bring that out, heal that. Um, the tendency is that stuff starts to rise, we wanna quiet it down and distract ourselves and uh, do something to, to keep it all repressed. Um, and so we wall it off with fear and with shame. And, um, and so there's, you know, is, uh, I think the Dalai Lama once said, everybody's carrying a great burden. Everybody's carrying a great burden. Um, and even simply just looking in the eyes of, you know, of each other um, and knowing that, um, but I think this unwillingness to feel deeply is, is uh, creates epidemic homelessness of spirit. Um, and, uh, and so starting with ourselves and then, you know, our, you know, start close in as David White, the poet would say, start close in, not with the, not with the third thing or the second thing, but with the first thing. Um, and that's ourselves and, and then our family. Mm. Yeah. And, and the people around us in our community. Um, how do we uh, tend those relationships? Um, and sometimes we do need a guide, somebody to assist us in knowing how to navigate that. Um, yeah. I think you're so right. People are afraid to feel because they're afraid they won't be able to handle that depth of feeling. Mm -hmm. They're afraid they're afraid they can't hold that. Right. Um, and, and they're not, uh, they're not meant to individually hold it. That's not how, um, that's what it's become. <clears throat> right. Uh, one of the things I've ended up actually doing a lot over there in the UK are, are facilitating these, these four day long grief rituals. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> the, what I say is grief is not a personal dilemma it's a collective responsibility. And that when we come together and, and bring our grief bundles and our stories to the circle um, and just begin to enter into connection and story about what I've carried or what, what was carried by the ones before me. And we just bring those to the, bring those to the shrine as it were and, and share these stories and begin to collectively gather uh, this this emotion and and then going into the ritual um, and just letting letting that uh, community support uh, hold what we can't hold because we're um, both trying to hold it and express it at the same time doesn't work and that's what that's the kind of dilemmas we end up in and it just leads to compulsions addictions obsessions as a way to manage that unresolved grief. Um, mm -hmm. And people say, well, well, what about these angry people? And I say, don't worry about them because an angry man is the man on the road to grief and the sooner he gets there, the better for him. And so sometimes we treat anger as this, this different thing, but it's just petrified grief. Wow. Um, and anger. so if we, we keep, our, keep our eyes on, on where we're headed with, with that, it's like, no, we, they, they need to be held in the, in the container too, you know. Um, and uh, it's just a, it's a, 
a stopping point on the way to heal, to grief and healing. Um, and so this, uh, yeah. So as Joanna Macy said, it's, it's a, her opinion now is the unwillingness to feel deeply what we see happening with each other and on the planet. And the fear response would be to rally, as I say, circle the wagons and try and just, you know, preserve whatever limited resources you think you have. And, um, and you know, that's, that's not gonna work. It, it, may, it may provide a temporary relief and the illusion that this is good, but that ain't gonna work. <laughs> no, we can see that sort of playing out in our external world at the moment, yeah. I think. I was just thinking as you were speaking about, you know, our unwillingness to feel and feel deeply. I wonder, you know, we hear a lot about more sensitives, the children coming in are more <clears throat> sensitive, more spiritual. They have, you know, crystal children and indigo <clears throat> children and all these, these sort of labels. But I wonder, do you see that as being true? And maybe that's a response to our unwillingness to feel. Mm -hmm. do you think so I do true? think it is a, uh, uh, and if we think of our collective human soul, and that there are different aspects, that um, collective humanity has its own antibodies of response that are offered up. And they, they come in the form of generational uh, patterns of awareness um, that, are, um, that are coming in response to the turmoil. And to put that in an indigenous uh, context, um, it would go something like this. That they say, well, we, we come here from the realm of the ancestors. And before coming here, it would be like you look down here and say, they're in trouble and they need this particular medicine and i can and i have this particular medicine i want to bring this down there and then you look around the realm of the ancestors and i and say i need your help and your help and your help because you carry this medicine too so when i get down there together we're going to bring this and so then we then we come into the physical realm and by the age of like generally around four or five we forget um, these kind of connections <clears throat> And we don't, uh, more and more we do, but typically we don't live in an environment that sees the one who's being born as having come here with a gift that is needed or medicine. Um, with the, the Western, at least over here in, in contemporary society, the paradigm more is that you're born in and your aptitude and your interests are measured. And then we, we hand you an occupational handbook in high school and say, choose a direction. Um, and that's very different than you've come here with something that's needed. And the, like the Latin root of the word uh, education comes from uh, the word educare, and it means to draw forth from within. And so a, a teacher's job is to identify what is this gift this one carries, how can I help them pull that out? And so the initiatory experiences are rites of passage experiences. Um, that are embedded in different, different ancestral cultures and their mo modern versions of walkabouts or hill walking or vision quest or ways of being mentored and going into an initiatory rite of passage. These rites of passage initiations are designed to activate the memory of the medicine that we carry and how to align ourselves with that medicine. They say, the degree that you feel turmoil in your life can also be to the degree that you have become misaligned with the very gift that you carry and you're living a life that's not your own and so when you line up with that that gift that medicine that you carry then your life has a, a certain trajectory and flow to it um and so this uh yeah this patterning of of um coming into the world with intention and gift and purpose. Um, very different than, than contemporary society. Yes. Mm. I wonder if you could speak about the dream time. Speak more about that and the collective dreaming of the earth mm -hmm. and how that relates to our individual and collective dreaming of humanity. And what are the 
the healings there that we could bring into our lives? Um, it's a concept that I drew partly from my understanding of the Aboriginal Dreamtime teachings. But as I began to work with people more and more around healing connections to themselves and to earth, <clears throat> what I realized is that we are, we are the extensions of the earth dreaming, to put it mythically. Um, you know, we, we know that we carry within our, our uh, physical body the same stardust that can be found circling uh, the cosmos. And this idea of, you know, earth my body, water my blood, air my breath, and fire my spirit. We, are, we have the elemental makeup within us. We are, we are the walking extension of the elemental ancestors, we could say. Um, so we're not separate from this, this earth. And so if we think of the earth as uh, a dreaming body, that brings into creation, then we are the walking, dreaming consciousness extension um, of that dreaming. Um, and therefore it becomes our collective responsibility to both listen to that original dreaming through us and redream the earth. So it's as similar as I mentioned that old Irish proverb about the troubles in the other world can be healed from here. And those troubles can only be, and our troubles can only be healed from there. Same with the earth. It's like this reciprocal responsibility or dreaming that we have been brought into creation uh, from the, the planetary waters of this earth. And now we are here at this, uh, at this phase of, of uh, creation. Uh, and on a 24 hour clock where you look at the planet, we haven't been here that long. We're, we're, as a species, we're only been here a very short time. But yet we carry this, uh, these amazing capacities of, uh, of imagination and, and creativity. Um, and so if we listen to, once again, begin to listen and watch the patterning and the dreaming that's, that's inherent from the earth in nature, and then align ourselves, and then our dreams, as I say, beginning to connect our dreaming uh, deeply connected with the earth's dreaming, then we too begin to dream in a, a new earth. Um, to borrow a word from Echo Tolle's book. Um, but this, uh, yeah, so this, this dreaming, connecting people back in, this rewilding, this reconnecting, and then deep listening. Um, I've literally done rituals with people around this dilemma um, of uh, radical earth ritual where um, where they are buried up to here, holding two crystals like you showed me earlier um, in their hands um, and beginning to drop into feeling the earth and, and listening and then coming out, of, coming out of that ritual experience with some sense of belonging and direction um, of, of being a, a steward uh, of this beautiful planet this blue green planet that we are on. Um, so connecting those dreamings, the dreaming of the earth so that it becomes our dreaming and therefore we dream in the new earth. Um, if we're not connected, then we're, we're following other mythologies that are um, devoid of gra spiritual ground. Um, and, and the mythologies we tend to follow if we don't, if we're not connected to our own mythology and the mythology of the planet, then we just adopt the, the um, contemporary society's mythologies, which are more about um, scarcity and consumerism and better and less than thinking. Um, or if you just, as Joseph Campbell says, if you just look around and thought, find the tallest building, that's the mythology you're going to adopt <laughs> is whatever the tallest buildings are. That's the mythology of the culture. And wow. so our tallest buildings are the economic centers. Mm. It used to be the spiritual centers. Now they're the economic centers of commerce. Those are the tallest ones, the banking centers. And so this is the contemporary side to society's mythologies. And so if we're not intentionally connecting to our own uh, personal mythology, our bone memory, and maybe having that activated through 
rites of passage initiations that connect us back to the earth and to the to nature um, then we're simply going to adopt a mythology that as i say is devoid of that kind of spiritual ground um, and we and we carry a sense of uh homelessness um, and i've heard uh, i may have been mother Teresa and, and other people um, that travel to this country and say there's such spiritual homelessness in this country over here um, in contemporary society um, so those are yeah that's just a few thoughts on healing that, that wound where do you think home is is it a place or is it where? <clears throat> it's uh it's for me home is in the experience of connection and um, both to myself and to the others, human and non-human. Mm. Uh, it's in uh, deep relationship with the other, whatever that other happens to be. Um, if uh, one of my early mentors in, in, in the field of rites of passage, Stephen Foster and Meredith Little, I remember Stephen said, if you ever wanna make any place sacred, in nature just go and sit there long enough and notice every detail of everything around you within 20 feet you know the squirrel that comes down the branch in the morning at at you know 6 a.m every morning comes down this walk and this cardinal that seems to fly across here each day at this time said when you start to notice the surroundings like that then the surroundings notice you Yes. And so a place of belonging is not really about how well you know a place or how well you can tell me about a place. Um, a place, one, you, belonging is about how well the place gets to know you. Um, and so this way of, um, it, it shifts that belonging to, uh, away from kind of my mental description of a setting to do the ones that live in this place know my name. Does the hummingbird and the woodpecker that sits out on the tree each morning, I drink my coffee, know that I too sit here mm -hmm. and, and together we know each other. Um, so that's belonging. This is this a relational connection, not just this one way connection of, of being able to describe something well, um, but something much deeper than that that's mutual. That's so beautiful. Thank you. I know we're coming to the end of our time together. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to share? Um, my, uh, what I would leave the, our listening audience with is, uh, is the importance um, of a good question. Um, and that the, the questions we carry become uh, things that we follow in our life and let, let it be a, a, maybe a question you can't even answer in this lifetime. Um, but something that guides your life. Um, and then the other thing I would, um, ask of our listening audiences is, is, uh, in a world where we live in so much, uh, psychologizing of our experience is to not leave this conversation between, Monique and I with, wow, what, what was all that? What does all that mean? Um, but to ask yourself the question, given what I just heard from Monique and Cater, what are the actions that I'm guided to take today, this week? When I go home with my children tonight, when I meet my colleagues at work in the morning, what are the actions that I'm guided to take? because of what I've heard this day. And uh, I say, if those actions fall within one's integrity and value system, then they're worth taking, even if you don't understand them. Um, and to follow that thread. And when you take those actions, something else appears in the river, another stone all of a sudden appears that you didn't see before that you then step to next. Um, but we, we tend to default our responsibilities by getting lost in meaning, uh, in my opinion, too much. And um, it's just, uh, I, like the, I like the question better. It's like, given, given in light of all of this, what actions does this guide me to take in my life today, this week? What simple action 
not with my whole life, just when I get home or when I get to work. Uh, Perfect. Beautiful. So, Cater, if people want to go deeper with you, learn more about your work, what's the best way they can connect with you? Um, so, the um, connecting through my um, website. Um, also, uh, if you link uh, to the newsletter from the website, you'll get an auto, you'll get an automatic audio download gift of a story called Singing Stone. That's about the initiatory journey. Um, also, if you um, join the newsletter, you'll be entered into a free drawing um, for a 30-minute divination um, that after this, these episodes air, then I'll go in and pull all those names, and I'll pull three names out um, and contact them to receive a free 30-minute divination. Um, and then I do a number of things over there in the UK. I know we're, we have a wide audience here that's, that's listening um, but, uh, again, getting on the newsletter would be the best way to find out about those things happening, okay. um, yeah. over in Europe and in the UK, we have some things happening next year as well. So I'll put the links, um, on this page underneath the video for anyone who wants to sign up for your newsletter and, and you'll be entered into that fantastic, uh, drawing. Yes. And if you want to read about divinations, there is a place on the website. You can just read about what is this thing more in depth about divinations, Kauri shell divination. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your beautiful wisdom. It's just been so fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. So thank you so much. Mm, my pleasure. Thank you, Monique, for the invitation and, um, and much gratitude to those ones that have come before us and on whose shoulders we stand. And, um, and may we listen to the prayers of those coming after us and how we do tend this earth, this beautiful planet that we live on. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much.